is it possible to work with these technologies in ways which share the benefits more equally and enable more people to create and experience art? So those are some of the kind of threads that we'll be exploring through this discussion. So first you're gonna hear from each panelist in turn, um, and this will be followed by a group conversation and then kind of um, opening that up to questions that you'll have submitted, we hope. Um, so I've asked each panelist to briefly introduce their work and to pose a couple of short arguments for why they think digital technologies could reveal possibilities for more ethical and sustainable art economies, as well as a counter argument for why they don't. And also I've asked them to consider whether these uh, possibilities are being currently being provided for in traditional pathways of artist development. So that's enough from me. Um, first up is KDM and yeah, over to you, Cade. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Before I start, I would like to just acknowledge that we're participating in an event that although isn't rooted in a physical space, it's nonetheless dependent upon uh, displacement and destructions of nations, landscapes and ecologies. and although we're having a discussion about the ethics of, of payments and, and um, uh, collective action in networks, we are collectively operating on just a slither of a deeply unethical system. I also wanna thank Danielle, Helen and Kieran for being uh, co-speakers. I think that this is a pretty amazing lineup and I'm really honored to be a part of that. And also to Lucy, Joe and the Creative United team uh, for inviting me here today. So the New Design Congress is a research organization that started on the 1st of January, 2020. It's born from a number of years of work at this, uh, around three separate arguments that I have towards uh, digital infrastructure. Coming from a background in interface design, I see both the interface and the digital and digital infrastructure as political, social, economic, and environmental accelerants, which is, Seems like an obvious thing to say, however, so much of what has been written in the last three or four years around digital infrastructure sees it as a cause of these issues. Of, of, it sees it, frames it as a, as a space which, which helps to generate issues or generate new conditions in society rather than accelerating combinations of existing ones. The second is that this is draws a little bit from people like Marshall McLuhan and other philosophers uh, all infrastructure itself is an expression of power and indeed the act of building infrastructure, be it from a digital startup through to uh, social networks in the real world, all every piece of infrastructure that's built is an expression or a desire to express some form of power in the world. The third is that solutionism at scale, which is what we've uh, in from a digital, uh, from, a, from a technology perspective, uh, a lot of this intervention and solutionism at scale reinforces existing inequalities. And from these arguments, the New Design Congress seeks to understand the cascading relationships of seemingly unconnected components of societies and their technologies. I want to quickly go through some of the work that we've done and then answers, uh, provide some sort of answer to some of this work. This is a larger piece of work that also goes into climate and ecologies as well, but that's not super relevant for today. Also this year is a postponed exhibition that I'm doing with Further Field called the Treaty of Thinsbury Park. And the Treaty of Thinsbury Park itself uh, is a, a, a fictitious LARP that we're holding in 2021 in which NASA prepares a mission to colonize Mars. But uh, a number of years later in 2025, uh, there's a catastrophic event that happens around now. Turns out it may have been the pandemic. And as a result of that, uh, there's a multi-special um, treaty signing uh, ceremony that, um, we were going to invite artists and, and people to, uh, as I said, it's this um, uh, postponed for now. And uh, what it sort of covers is this idea of ecologies as networks and machines as ecologies. This is again, drawing from the ideas of our artificial wilderness, also urban governance and non-human real estate and the idea of dictating the space at the expense of all other creatures. As you can see in the bottom right-hand corner in the top right-hand corner, this is um, 
examples of humans othering themselves from the rest of the world. And then looking at humans as curious monolinguists, looking for intelligent life inside spaces, but not so much in, in, um, in, in, uh, in other species. And also taking, seizing upon the existing structures such as um, uh, representations of power through uh, ritual of, of states and things like that, state dinners and so on. Finally, I'm working on a video essay called This Is Fine, which describes a large, how large scale decentralized movements challenge power. And then they are because of the flaws inherent within our power structures uh, easily destroyed and thusly are caught in a loop. I just realized I don't have a lot of time left. So I'm kind of running through these very quickly. So today we're talking about withdrawing from a hustle economy. And this is true both of and every form of this from Uber through to um, these kind of precarity that we find art societies in. I'm drawn to the example of um, Greenwood, which is the district in um, uh, Oklahoma in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s. And the fact that this, uh, that this, this group uh, and this, this market, if you like, was able to sustain black communities in the United States until it was destroyed in a massacre in 1921. This has been revived in name by a bank uh, that's launching for black and Latino customers by three uh, black American executives and, and entrepreneurs, uh, mayor, former Atlanta mayor, Andrew Young, Killer Mike, a rapper, and an executive, Ryan Glover. And what's interesting about this is, and I quote, they look at the, um, the figure of a dollar circulating within the Greenwood district 36 times before leaving the community in 1920 versus six hours today. So this idea is that if you control infrastructure, you can then control a component of the, of the world that you're living in and, and, and bring yourself up through this economic solidarity. So I was thinking of how can we find bits like this, and I'm, apologies, I'm gonna go over a little bit. So I, I'm very, very sorry. I was thinking about different groups and how beyond just looking at the, the, like a, 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 the, the African-American communities in the United States, what are some other examples of, of this kind of work being done at, right now? I'm interested in solutions or, or examples of, of communities that have put themselves forward and built this infrastructure. What you're seeing here is a video um, of one of the world's best esports player, a guy named Sonic Fox. He's a furry. And in 2018, he won the Games Award. Um, and as you can see from here is his, in his acceptance speech, and this is one of many copies of it, he sustained a huge amount of harassment um, at, for just winning this award as a black gay furry. And this is interesting because furries themselves actually have a, um, actually have a, a large, uh, it's, a, it's a subculture of people who believe in anthropology, or not believe in, they, they, find, uh, in uh, they find solidarity in this culture of anthropomorphized characters. And yet at the same time, even though this uh, community is over 20 years old, there's a huge persecution online and harassment campaign against furries in this way. And so what's happened is over the course of this period of time, furries from all over the communities have started to build, all over the world, have started to build their own spaces. What you're seeing here, for example, is um, a pandemic ad adaptation. These are communities who have produced uh, in historically large, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? large communities and marketplaces around conferences that people travel to around the world and huge transactional natures of commissions and fursuits, people building um, costumes for each other for large amounts of money. On the right here, you are seeing video game examples of this in which that, that model this economic solidarity and mass marketed furry media properties. This is where, as you can see here, each piece of artwork within a, a publicly released um, mainstream video game is actually commissioned from hundreds of different artists. What we're seeing here, I think, is an interesting thing, which is that although the annual income of a con like a conference going furry, that's someone who may spend quite a bit of money in the community, the, the actual annual income in the United States is very similar to the income of uh, the, the overall average in that country. And yet in the last 12 months, as you can see on the right here, um, there is an actual not um, insignificant spend by, by each survey member around the kinds of material that they consume and buy outright as opposed to streaming or um, just browsing or looking at and things like this. And what I'm interested in is this idea of how through this, uh, this precarity and vulnerability to attack in the case of a global furry community, this comes from 
a space of uh, online harassment from others in the gaming culture and beyond. There exists this, uh, this massive network of people who have built their own infrastructure from payments to databases, to virtual conferences and et cetera. And this has been done in partnership with artists, in partnerships with costume designers and other people who have created media. And it's a large sort of completely insular group that have worked together. And I think this is interesting because it comes to this idea of like the lowering costs of partnerships around um, digital infrastructure and how you can use that to build solidarity within a network. So, so here we have three examples. Lurk um, is an, an arts practice and loose cooperative that hosts their own services. Artsy itself hosts an open source tech program and an emergent one based on alternative pandemic infrastructure has also arrived. But beyond that too, too I think there's interesting cases that we can see that look much further beyond in different ways. For example, the Appalachian Broadband Solidarity Network, also known as the uh, Southern Connected Communities Project, and indeed um, financial versions of this, such as the cooperatively owned Patreon alternative, Camaraderie. These are examples of spaces that can actually do this. But I think what's really interesting is that there's a network here that can be studied and we can talk about in this panel in which uh, that I think we can learn from in terms of furry solidarity. Uh, that was a much rushed version of that. I thank you very much. And I hand it over to the next speaker. I'm sorry for going over time. Great, thank you, Cade. Um, it was worth it. <laughs> so, um, right, moving swiftly on, um, Danielle. Hi, um, how do I share my screen? Thanks, Cade, that was really great. Um, thank you. Right. Yeah, loads to take in there. Um, lots to come back to, I think. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Danielle Brathwaite Shirley um, and I am an artist and self-proclaimed game designer. But most of the things I actually do, I would call them um, archive and archiving. And uh, the reason I, I, I call that because um, I feel that the archives have failed to record black trans people um, and a lot of black people as well and have failed to archive and store us within current history and so that in order to remember us we cannot use the same systems that this archiving uh, this the techniques that archiving currently uses so we have to invent our own ways in order to archive each other uh, and ourselves and so my um, approach to this was actually to build a game, an archive that could respond to the user, that could respond to the person playing it. So one of the first things you have to do when accessing this archive, we are here because of those that are not, um, is choose your identity. And depending on what you chose, determined on actually what was accessible within the space and what was not. Um, and, oh, sorry, let me just go back a second. Um, and yeah, this was made with about 15 different black trans people. Um, and we all had a conversation about what those choices meant, what it meant to archive ourselves and what it meant to um, have that question of actually wanting to archive particular things about us rather than what things does the world tell us to record about ourselves. Um, and this is another, another archive I've made, which is more of a self archive, which is about the wish of being able to resurrect past uh, ancestors, buried bodies that cannot be remembered because we have lost their history. And most of these actually exist online for free, completely free. And that's because when I was first making the original archive, the Black Trans Archive, um, most of the people that I cared about would not enter that space and did not have a space within a gallery. Um, they were not represented in any way. They could not be represented and the space would not allow them. Actually, um, in one case that when we did bring them in, security stopped them from coming in the gallery in the first place. Um, and so which kind of reinforced this idea that they're not actually welcome in the space at all. And so which meant that it was extremely important to put everything online and make it very accessible for anyone to view um, at any moment. And this has its pros and cons, um, but this kind of got me interested in how this online, um, this kind of online environment exists in terms of accessing work, accessing um, spaces, but also protection um, and kind of like making a community, building a community that can expand. Um, and these are just some shots of installation. I'm not gonna go too much over those, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. Okay. And so my blah, blah, blah. Sorry. Okay. And so 
Um, the, what I'm more interested in now is actually building a kind of um, a market from this, not really a market in which I benefit and sell this archive, but in a way that in which the community that builds around these archives can continue to make money. Um, something that we do do is when we work with everyone, everyone that we do work with is paid. It's not a kind of system where these people aren't seen as important. Um, everyone is treated as a team member which is something that is not usually happening in archives. So anyone that touches the archive gets paid. And that's something that I wanted to um, prolong. And so I'm beginning to look at models such as a pop-up combos model, which is they're an online um, video game creator and they create games in the style of old PlayStation 1. But something they did that uh, really piqued my interest um, was they created this, which was called, which is called the Haunted PS1 Demo Disc, which um, they have a, basically a community that creates games similar to those, but they're not all as well known as Puppet Combo is um, in this kind of indie horror scene. And so Puppet Combo collated all these games and put it on one fake disc, virtual disc, to distribute in order to use a kind of social capital to get these people um, more um, views, accessibility, sales, all of this kind of thing. And it was a really interesting kind of a way of a, a very small community coming together to create something that they, they always wanted and um, using a channel which has much uh, more views and much more um, eyes on it to then give the community a wider kind of um, distribution ability. Um, and another thing that uh, made me look at a lot more was, um, and I'm, I'm obviously everything I'm showing is to do with video games, but that's because I'm really into it, um, is to do with the GoFundMe models. And so currently um, the GoFundMe models I find quite strange because my introduction to it was a lot of my friends were using it to try and get surgeries, try and get medication that they needed and they couldn't afford. Um, and so I find that it's a weird sort of kind of advertisement hole that you have to go down in order to get what you need and not everyone can do that. But the ZX Spectrum had a really, uh, it's called a ZX Spectrum Next, had a really interesting um, GoFundMe model, which was every time they reached a different goal, they would start paying developers to build games. So they started paying the community out of their own stretch goal to design something that they wanted. So uh, it became larger and larger and larger and larger. And so as they, they completely destroyed their funding goals, but now all the developers that wanted to make games for them, all the people that were making games in the community and had no money before, were now getting all their products funded completely. Um, which was a really interesting way of doing it rather than just building something that selfishly they wanted. They actually decided to find people in the community um, that wanted to build these games and fund their own games as well. Um, and something that I'm interested in, but it's also a bit of a, a mess uh, currently within the gaming market is something called microtransactions. And you might have seen these on your phones. You might have seen these on uh, games like Fortnite. This is an example. Um, and usually the small things you can buy with, often they use a fake currency like diamonds or something like this, but in which you put real world money in to get maybe a cosmetic item or um, they do th these things called loot crates. Um, which essentially like spring out uh, treats that you can have in in game, um, and these are I think these are good and bad. Some of these microtransactions are very interesting because they allow the player to really express themselves um, when it's on a free to play model. So you can actually the character can actually customize the avatar so uh, it represents how much they're into this game. But at the same time, you have these kind of uh, market which can definitely take advantage of like a younger audience who plays these games, who is a much larger, larger target audience to these types of games. But uh, with my microtransactions for me, I, I really feel like it's a really good um, point for donations. I feel like it's a really good point of access for donations, for um, selling um, assets made by curators and artists within communities. Um, and I have examples of this later, but these are just some examples of some cosmetic changes you can have. Um, but Occupy Free, o Occupy White Walls um, is essentially an artist MMO, MMO. It's called an RMMO, that's what they've called it. And essentially it allows you to build galleries online and have people view them. 
Um, and so it's essentially kind of what the art market wants, kind of an, a completely online space. It's completely free to use. Um, anyone can use it, but also anyone can build their own gallery and get people to view it. And something that uh, really interested me with this one is that I wish that, which it doesn't have, um, but the fact that you can build your own galleries, you can't necessarily put your own art assets in and um, kind of ticket your event or something like this. But it, it really feels like a, a market for that. It feels like a space that can allow a larger understanding of someone who maybe can't set foot in a gallery, but could build one online and allow that space to be visited by others. And because it's massively online and um, free to play, um, you can kind of get different tiers of people involved. So those that just want to visit the gallery, those that, that want to invest in people making particular kind of galleries or particular art, and then those that want to maybe buy those art assets um, for their own gallery and, and then show it in their own kind of gallery. So I feel like there's a kind of in a, in a market there that's really, really interesting to delve into. Um, and there's also this space called Alt Space VR, which is essentially a VR chat. And something they, that they do that's really interesting is that they pay people to come in to do lectures um, in this alternative reality. So sometimes they have, uh, similar to Fortnite, sometimes they have uh, concerts, but sometimes they have a yoga teacher, sometimes they have um, someone that does a panel like this, but it's all framed in virtual reality. But what that does is allow you to have conversation with the people there as well as the people on the panel. And that's something that I don't really see much in these kind of virtual spaces that allow conversation directly by the voice between um, viewers that, the, that won't interrupt the panelists. That's something that I feel that's really missing out when we're in um, a physical space is that you can talk about the work ne next to someone. Um, without interrupting the work. And that's something I don't think online spaces really hold. And that's my very short presentation. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> Excellent. Loads of food for thought. Helen, we'll move swiftly on to you. And I feel like this all should have happened in alt space VR, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi there. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about a work um, that I premiered at um, our bike gallery in February. Um, it's called Trickle Down, A New Vertical Sovereignty. It's a collaborative um, artwork. And um, it has four layers to it. Um, it's a functional sculpture, which you can see in the middle. Um, it's a four screen video projection, a generative soundscape, which is triggered by sensors, which record the data of where the audience stand in the space. And also, and quite importantly, an administrative layer, which attaches the work to the blockchain and it makes payments to everybody involved. And it also um, makes sure that the movement of currency and interaction with the artwork is both traceable and transparent. So just gonna show you a few pictures. So the artwork is actually triggered by a mechanical sculpture which accepts one pound coin. So you can see it here in the middle of the room. And the videos, so as you walk into the room, um, you're kind of faced with this sort of strange transparent panel and it encourages you through the four screens surrounding it to insert a coin rather like, um, uh, you know, um, a normal sort of uh, gambling actually. And by putting the coin in, it triggers the four videos, which um, are basically, um, they are four auctions that I attended around the world. So I'm just gonna give you a quick bit of background about these auctions. So back in 2014, I was studying at Goldsmith and commuting between London and Manchester on a weekly basis. And I became acutely aware of the disparity between the financial capital and the provinces, all the more so as an artist who traverses between different economic communities, sometimes attending glitzy art openings in high-end commercial galleries in the West End of London, and at others walking the neglected streets of East Manchester next to my studio in Gorton. 
Back then, I decided to focus my camera at the wealthy as they seemed to generally evade scrutiny and decided the best place to go to get an insight into the world of auction houses was um, Sotheby's. So I actually went to, um, this is the important Russian art auction. Um, and I'm just gonna play you a little bit of this, play you this video actually. Um, so what you'll notice is that basically I only photographed, and this was because nobody wealthy wants to be photographed, have their identity given over. I just photographed the clothes that the people were wearing. And this had everything about the texture of this community. Um, the other auctions that I attended, oh, sorry, hang on, were um, this one, um, which I'm not going to play you because there's not enough time, but this is um, shot in North Manchester. Um, and it was, it's a bric-a-brac market basically next to my studio. It's the absolute opposite end of the wealth spectrum. Um, oh, hang on. And then this one, which I'll just give you a very um, quick uh, feeling of. Um, I basically wor worked with fact in Liverpool and I went into a prison and um, I worked with the prisoners and I looked at their value system. And the really fascinating thing was when we came up with the idea of staging an auction, we asked them what they wanted. And they said, well, we just want something to look after. We want some plants. So, you know, going from the extreme of Sotheby's, um, you know, we've uh, basically here, you've got just, um, you know, the prisoners who, and I'll just play you a little bit of it. <laughs> Welcome to HMP Oak Course Time Auction. For those who don't know me, my name is Robbie Dutton and I'll be your auctioneer for today. For those who have never been to an auction, this is where we bid on stuff, but today we are not bidding in currency, we are bidding in time. So, the bidding process will go in minutes, hours and days. That's your time. Forget your current wage, what you'd be getting. <laughs> Please, lads, pay respect. If you want to place a bid, you'll raise your card as high as possible so I can see. So if you bid a full day, it's a full day. It's a full day, six hours. A full day is six hours. 
Okay, so I'm not going to play the whole thing, but you get the idea. But that was the difference with the prisoners' auction was instead of using money, they basically bid with their time. And um, some of them ended up working about a day and a half in order to buy a plant, which they sold, sent to their relatives. So the final auction that I attended was um, the Ethereum Summit, which was in New York. And it was where the first ever digital artwork was um, uh, sold. And I'll just give you a kind of feeling of this auction. <laughs> We're all here today for a very important reason. The Codex Auction. The Codex is a decentralized registry for unique assets. We are focused in particular on art and collectibles. Because art is an amazing thing. It changes the way that we think about the world. But it's also a financial asset class. One that sophisticated investors have used for hundreds of years as an uncorrelated store of value. We believe that crypto holders should use it for the same. So, um, I mean, that, that line, you know, you couldn't really have <clears throat> paid someone to say it, but it was quite beautiful the way they said it, it was an art's an amazing thing, but it's also a financial asset class. So... Um, the other thing that I did was I worked with the prisoners and also an oligarch's wife and um, the market sellers um, and the um, employees at Consensus System, which is the people behind Ethereum, to um, sing. Because again, I was at this idea of um, the texture of these communities. And so um, this is just a very quick snippet of the, um, the workshop that I did with the prisoners. There are systems in systems in systems in systems in systems there are systems in systems in systems there are systems in systems in systems in systems there are 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 systems in so um, here you can see um, the people singing at Consensus System. And these are the sensors that um, I built with um, a creative technologist um, to pick up the movement in the room. And um, here, these, are, these photographs are interesting because what I was trying to do with this piece was expose the hardware, you know, the infrastructure, which Cade so brilliantly talked about. And um, this was, um, and that's why it's a kind of transparent sculpture. Um, and here you can see, this is the insert for the sculpture, which is um, if you go, you can see on the right there, that's where you can see the transaction to the blockchain. So the point of the blockchain is that when that pound goes into the machine, it registers th by passing through um, uh, a piece of metal tape, it sends a message to trigger the installation. And at the same time, it sends a message to the blockchain to um, access the smart contract um, and basically pay everybody who's been involved in the work. Okay, I can see I've got one minute left. So just very quickly, here's the letter that I wrote to everybody involved in the project. Um, and that was just asking them to make a wallet. Not everybody wanted to do that. And here, this is a poster that I made, which, uh, you know, you basically got as part of going into the installation. And this showed you the kind of financial transactions and the last thing to say is that, interestingly, the bank account where the money, so this real physical money goes into a hole in the ground and it sits there until the gallery staff go and put it in the bank. And I had to set up um, this administrative layer working with lawyers of a not-for-profit, which is overseen by humans. And I had to then access that bank account, put that money, make a change it into Ethereum and put it in a smart contract. And that's overseen by a machine, which is um, the blockchain. So um, yeah, that's basically the piece of work. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that I um, also run an art collection called Birthrights. And we're looking at the way that we might be able to use um, the blockchain in the provenance of artworks and automating payments through smart contracts. Final thing I want to say is I'm not completely convinced about blockchain. I think it has some interesting elements. And that's why I did this project to kind of try and understand what the hell it was. And, you know, kind of like, like sort of see what its functions were and where it sort of worked and where it didn't. Thank you, Helen. Another brilliant presentation. So last but not least, Kieran. 
Hi, um, thank you. And thank you everyone for those presentations. Um, so um, I'm Kieran Reid, I'm the Slade, uh, I'm the director of the Slade School of Fine Art. And um, I am an artist and my practice and, and my research is orientated around socially engaged and um, participation art practices. Um, but today I'm gonna to be talking about um, the Slade and um, um, the future of arts education. So we're now living through an industrial revolution. Many workers are now again based in the home and methods and ways of working have changed. The first industrial revolution was the transition of um, to new manufacturing processes and workers moved to cities from small towns, villages and rural locations. We are temporarily in an opposite position. Workers are returning home and many people are looking to leave cities. Um, the current evolution of the workplace and the ways we engaged with the world around us will impact upon the arts and artists. And we need to further adapt our ways of working to meet these challenges and, and address anxieties um, with live digital interactions and how we interrupt this digital fourth wall where we're all speaking now. Um, through disruptive technologies, um, the fourth industrial revolution or 4.1 now considering COVID with um, workers um, returning back to the homestead, um, it's changing the way we live and work. Artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, virtual reality, machine learning and advanced robotics are affecting our society, our economy, our environment and our politics in both predictable and unpredictable ways. It's almost certain that these technology, technological advances will overtake current mechanical and digital processes and will allow for previously unthinkable to become a normalised reality. It is thought that one of the most immediate outcomes of the fourth industrial revolution is the automation of manual processes and as this accelerates the development of the of automation uh, that undertakes these processes. As artists we deal with materials and objects traditionally in two and three dimensions and through time. We connect with our senses in considering how our audience experiences an artwork. An artist and the viewer has a relationship to the materials and the objects as well as to the processes of making, making them and um, often both making and viewing art is connected to direct experience and place. Frequently, frequently we are talking about offering people the interdisciplinary teaching, learning, training and skills to enter the workforce um, um, and most likely to one day carry out jobs that at present don't yet exist. How will we prepare artists for new forms of art or for employability in an ever-changing future? And how as an art school should we evolve to enable critical discourse within this technical and theoretical field? Artists are highly skilled and trained to read and decipher images uh, and their interconnecting meanings. Artists are also disruptive, um, uh, much like these new technologies, and they often think in abstract and unconventional ways. Cyber companies, and I'll come back to this bit later, um, have been saying they need more arts graduates to take on the jobs in this sector and industry um, and sector and industry is looking to learn from the arts and enable them to understand more creative ways of thinking and developing new ideas. The Slade has 150th anniversary in October in 2021. For us to properly consider our future, we're looking at our past and looking to see what we could have done better. The Slade has a responsibility to review and update its pedagogies, methods and ways of working to be inclusive and to be representative of the diversity of London. The Slade has been interdisciplinary from the start. Um, mathematicians taught geometry and, um, and um, to painting students and uh, autonomous um, explain the body in life classes. Henry Tonks, a medical doctor, became the Slade professor. And during this time, we shared our building with the chemistry department. Professor William Ramsey discovered the noble gases, while Kenneth Meese, a PhD researcher in photography, or sorry, photographic theory, was researching film transparencies that will later be adopted by Kodak and become Kodachrome and color transparencies. UCL is building on its progressive history, um, positive impact and disruptive thinking, th disruptive spirit through the creation of a new campus in East London in the Queen Elizabeth Park. UCL East is the university campus of the future and we're bringing together UCL academic students and local communities and industry to solve the biggest challenges affecting people's lives and the planet today and into the future. I've been leading the work to develop a new program for the Slade in UCL East and in 2023 we are looking to start a new undergraduate in art tech. 
The course is being spe specifically developed to support um, students who are looking to study new ways of creating art that is connected to new and disruptive technologies. Students um, would have to choose, um, sorry, students who would had to have chosen between studying art engineering or computer science, or those wishing to have a career in arts, film, theatre, experience industries, or, uh, and connected to, uh, to new technologies. The course will provide a studio and talk program to develop students' practical and working knowledge of online and digital content experiences and technologies using creative AI, robotics, sensing, gaming, game architecture, virtual mixed augmented extended reality environments, um, but all connected to um, art practice. The course will have a unique multidisciplinary approach and only possible because of this Slade's position in a world leading multidisciplinary university where we share resources, teaching and knowledge with departments such as, um, as mentioned before, engineering, computer science, architecture and anthropology. And this way of working continues our traditions and mirrors the origins of when we first began in 1871. Students will learn through studio practice workshops and technologies that are available to them at UCL East and the course will have links to industry and there will be interconnected modules with other courses and with students from other disciplines. The way of making art will be underpinned through courses offering critical understanding of the debates about technology in the art, histories and humanities, an analytical assessment of technological use in architecture engineering. To this part of the course, students will be taught to consider and understand ethics, race and gender politics in art and technology. Our course will be constructed to support students um, learning subject disciplines needed to develop independent ideas and art whilst also linked to industry standards. Art tech will culminate in a final year uh, with independent research and assess through an art exhibition open to the public. Um, the art tech programme will provide a widening access course um, which will be open and flexible um, um, space for students from the five boroughs surrounding the park to join a summer long pre-degree multidisciplinary programme in art and making. And the course will be designed specifically to, to support students who have not been provided with a mandatory and high quality arts education. During the course, we aim to develop skills and portfolios needed to apply for higher education or employment. The course will assist in developing and implementing ideas and ways of working that equip pre-U students with the knowledge and understanding required for ethical and sustainable start to university. For me, the pandemic has been um, has specifically cast a lens onto art and creative industries and our resilience. The recent advert shared by the government offering the suggestion that the ballet dancer should retrain in cyber. I think the dancer should support those who commission the advert to retrain to better understand the relevance and the future of arts and humanities. At this moment, artists are considering the relationship with liveness and the relevance to the traditions, modes and norms of making art and presenting art um, to publics. Artists are not satisfied with the um, digital simulacra of the white cube modernist gallery space. More time and attention needs to be spent considering new ways where art can exist. And this needs to come from the artist and not from the gallery or the current marketplace. Um, for all our um, um, for all the Slade's fine art courses in Bloomsbury, we're surf we are surfacing notions about art futures and future art markets. We're already teaching students through a careers program how to engage with concepts linked to economics, growth, um, growth strategies, decentralized, non-London, living and employment, um, copyright, authorship, uh, marketing sales and art markets. As this advances, new ideas will be embedded and adopted to support alternative models of, um, of ownership of art, shared equity and fair resale rights. And these we managed, um, I assume, and these we manage and maintain through blockchain technologies. Thank you. That's um, what, what I needed to. Thank you. <laughs> Lucy, you're on mute at the moment. Oh, whoops. Uh, I'm back. I'm not on mute anymore. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I was just saying, yeah, four really amazing presentations there with so many kind of threads to pick up on. Um, and I know that we're already getting quite a few questions coming in as well. So um, I'm going to keep my questions uh, short so that we can open out to the audience. But um, an initial one, I think that quite a few of you have touched on really this idea of like building out communities, building out communities of interest, communities of solidarity. And um, I wanted to get your views, and this is an open question to the panel really on 
um, uh, what prevent is where is it happening now? What prevents it happening at least within our arts in the fine art context? Who would like to start? <laughs> Helen. Um, yeah, I just I suppose um, running um, the birthrights collection, which is a collection of contemporary art on childbirth. Um, there is um, solidarity in that community because the, the theme of the collection is something quite taboo, right? Um, traditionally, depicting birth is something that people don't want on their living room walls. You know, it's not um, like the kinds of objects that people would necessarily buy. So um, the way, and, and so when I started the collection, which was back in 2009, it, it came about because I'd, um, basically run um, uh, an exhibition where I got artists to work with health professionals and collaborate and we had we got funding from the Arts Council and we ended up with these five commissions and I then approached Salford University and said um, you know would you house this collection and it grew from five works to now 85 works and it's at King's College in London and it was through donations from the community of artists who, um, you know, were making work on this subject but didn't have an outlet for it. And so, you know, like to talk about like, you know, what kind of communities of solidarity there are in that situation, it was like very much bound up with literally donating, you know, people doing work, doing something and giving it. And so I'm, what I'm really interested in is the way that you balance that giving with what you kind of give back to the artist. So one of the things that we do is we, if someone gives a work of art, so we sometimes commission works of art and then they give it, and then, you know, um, they've kind of been paid to make that work. But if they just give it to us, we have a contract that says that um, we own it, obviously, but and we don't look to sell it. But if we ever did, we'd then go back to them and negotiate a split of the profits. And so what I'm interested in is, you know, what other ways can we um, help artists? And, and, you know, if they're going to, you know, work with us to give something, we have to be able to give them something back. And so thinking about tech infrastructures that could consolidate that and, you know, so yeah, that's my answer. It's not, it's not, not that I've got an answer, it's just what I'm trying to figure out. And I think it's interesting the way in which the subject matter, the taboo also becomes a, um, a point to coalesce around. And I think that's something in, in common with um, what Cade and Danielle have touched on as well in their presentations. And I guess like, it would be interesting to hear Cade Danielle, either of you, around a bit more around that, and um, um, what you think about these, um, yeah, the ability to build these communities, but also like how money flows within there. Like, to what degree is this about donation um, and exchange, and to what degree can you actually, you know, sustain yourself from it? Um, you know, buy food and so on <laughs> through those interactions. Um. Can, hold on, can I just get a bit more on understanding of what, like, donations, like, I'm a bit, um, I don't understand how that works, you know, I don't understand how um, them donating supports them. I, I'm not attacking you, I'm just like... No, 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 no. So, so the, the, in 2006, when I started, this subject matter in contemporary art was really, like, not... People didn't want to touch it, right? If you made work on the subject of birth, you got pigeonholed as a feminist artist, you know... Right. So, um, so artists were donating their work because it was an outlet. It was also setting up a collection is like this way of um, formalizing something, you know, make, giving it a sense, denoting authority to something, right? So, so artists were happy to donate their works to build this sort of um, place that we could talk about this subject, right? And so... Um, you know, and, and in return, we look after their artworks, which is not a small thing to look after artworks, you know, it requires like maintenance and, you know, a place to put it and all that kind of thing. We also exhibit the works for them. So like at King's, you've got like eight to, when, when not during pandemic, but you've got eight to 10,000 people who can 
see the work. So it's so it's kind of like, okay, they've given us an artwork, right? They haven't received any like payment for that artwork because we didn't have any money. I mean, I was working for free for like the first mm. five years, you know, and things might change, you know, but um, so, so the idea is just how can you compensate the artists for that? Like, obviously you don't just want to say, oh, here's some profiles. So, so maybe it's like looking at like what happens if their works ever do sell again in the future. And, you know, how can you make sure that they get something back from that? Whereas normally a collection would just acquire the work and it would be theirs. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's that. And then also looking at, um, you know, like reproductive rights. Um, you know, if we use the work again, you know, for like, let's say we make a digital um, edition of those works, for instance, you know, and we'd have a split between the artist and um, the collection. And I suppose, I mean, it, you know, I'm just trying to think of all the ways that that, that can exist. And I think what you, yeah. you're doing with your project when you talk about like you obviously have decided to pay people from the beginning which is great right and but but birthrights couldn't have done that at the beginning do you know what i mean it just literally didn't yeah. have those means yeah like i don't know um for me that's like a such a strange concept um to like donate work but it makes me think about like what um artist collections maybe don't do with artworks and we have this like really um and with like because because artists like their work presented in a particular way, we often ask, what's the one way you want the art presented? And if we can't present it in that way, we won't present it, you know? Um, and I feel like uh, some of these collections can be like, or these art pieces at least can be revisited and um, um, the question can be re-asked and, hey, um, we have an alternative means of presenting work now. How would you like to present the same work in a new manner? Mm -hmm. um, and I did this recently with, I, I made a rubbish game before, really bad. Um, and then someone said, I want you to present it, and but can you do it online? And so I had to re rebuild it. And just rebuilding it um, allowed us to like pay like three or four more people. Um, and and then the artwork was something completely different, but it's the same. And so um, I feel like the way you can like rebuild these um, artworks or kind of re relook at them and revitalize how you can actually like install them in spaces that they aren't usually installed in or maybe they weren't made for initially um, is a way of like really thinking about like making a market that currently isn't open available to them and something that um, um, I think like Puppet Combo does really well is that it knows uh, there's a limited market for people that want indie horror games. Um, and so what they start making is, and I'm not saying that I should do this, but they start making like bags, they start making like, um, they started making actual printed out discs of the thing. Um, and which was such a nice thing to have just because no one really makes printed out discs of stuff anymore. Um, and having these having these versions of, of the same thing, but just like an iteration made them able to sell it in a new market and made a, a, a different market kind of available to them. Mm -hmm. I, I jumped uh, in there actually, because that kind yeah. of whole thing about, you know, in a way of like, it's a horrible word, but you could call it like a derivative or a, you know, you're pulling out something from the artwork there and, and like giving it a diff slightly different purpose and then selling it and earning an income in a different way. Um, you know, relate, you know, merch is obviously happening in art too, but um, it is interesting how these platforms can give more, like they extend the possibilities for that potentially, like you mentioned, Danielle, within game purchasing and that kind of thing and treats and stuff like that. Um, do, does, what do people think about how much, like, can, can you survive off this? <laughs> What scale is required to earn? Is this like we talking about micro micro payments here, or can can this go a step further? Maybe Cage, you can I don't know, you know more about the economics, for example, of the furry community that you mentioned. So there's a what's interesting about it is that the income disparity for people working in the scene isn't as pronounced as it might be in other forms of of media or art markets. So you, one of the things that was really interesting about the pandemic is for people who were actually working as content creators within that space, 
there was both a decrease in uh, market like income through the the loss of um, uh, let's say uh, the con the conventions where art markets are traditionally held and art auctions and things like that, which happens a lot within that ecosystem. But there's also a an increase in the number of, um, uh, for example, commissioned pieces. I'm just looking at a a. Um, can I share my screen for a second, just to point, like, make a point? So, yeah. what you see here, for example, this is from the same group that that I was um, mentioning before. Um, when you look at um, print media and uh, hang on, where is it? Uh, oops. When you look at the material that's um, that's printed, uh, there's a high degree of um, across all, like across these really popular um, scenes, there's a, a whole lot of um, material that's that's then uh, purchased, which I think on average is a lot higher than you would have in, in, in other forms of, of art markets. Uh, and this is compared like in this particular work and we, uh, interestingly, there's not a lot of um, work around the economics of the of like a global furry community. And it's something that'd be really interested in, in like exploring further, but when you compare it even against um, other subcultures, and then when you look at like uh, the, if you like the the sports fans, which I, I interpret in this research as being like a more, a broader, more normalized group of people, if you like, or a more generalized group of people, um, what you see across these, these subcultures is a trend towards purchasing media. Um, oftentimes it's very unique, like it's either once-off pieces or limited edition kind of work. And I find that really interesting because because what you see even within the economic instability that we have today is that there is a huge services market in which you have artists who do their own work in di multiple different formats and then who then do like these commissions of very varying types and they can be as simple as print media as that graph that I just showed mentioned or it could be very intricate work such as um, building fursuits for you know one soft um, fursuits for you know four, 5,000, 10,000 US dollars. And so this, what, what's interesting about the furry community is how many different groups and disciplines it touches. It's not just about digital infrastructure and people making like costumes for people or drawing art for people. It's also, uh, you know, musicians who then get into unity to diversify their expression within that, that space. So you have popular furry musicians, there's entire economics around that, just the music scene itself and performing in their own spaces and so on. Um, you have groups that are only known within the furry community who make their entire livings just out of the furry community and only playing in those spaces, who then to diversify, move towards sort of what Danielle has been working on, which is bringing that, that skill set into, a, into like a video game engine and building other forms of art. And what's interesting, I think, is that there's a, just to finish that thought and what I'm trying to say here, is that the fact that there's a, a large market of independent buyers and sellers means that the work uh, can both live for long periods of time, depending on like the kind of artist and how they wish to present it, but also that there's a, a, an intrinsic understanding of solidarity and transactional um, solidarity there too. And it's interesting because it still contains that individuality or individualism that's we see in the broader society because indeed the furry community is about designing your own uh, fursona, if you like, your own character that you wish to inhabit, which is a deeply individualistic thing. But even within that that foundational component, there's a foundational philosophy. There's a broader sense of solidarity and a willingness for people to spend money on on um, on their favorite um, creators. And I think part of that too is just a huge accessibility thing where people are able to connect with each other. Um, people tend to support like small groups will work together on different artworks and work you know for years and then also typically you can meet the people that you're working with uh, or people that you buy art from as well does anyone want to add to any any of that before we move on and um start to take some questions uh, that people have been posting here i'm just aware of time yeah oh just quickly, yeah. um, does it say something about the nature of the kind of people who collect art? Like, um, mm. I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, what, like in the UK, for instance, you know, who invests in art, right? And, and it's also about like, 
this idea of feeling close to something and one like feeling um part of something i think what is caves talking about and how the art market is like not doing that i think and so um uh yeah i was just thinking about like what like the ways that we build up these relationships with you know people i suppose is really important and i suppose that's kind of where something like the collection is quite interesting because you know we're in a university it's about the pedagogy and teaching that happens between the artworks and these medics who who don't normally look at art you know and so they they start to build up these collection connections and then also women and parents and you know teenage mothers might be affected by it and it's so it's like broadening out into communities as opposed to kind of like you know the traditional kind of like you know super rich you buy something and sort of that accessibility I suppose. Now I guess it's also like a bit like they um when an artist usually makes a work to sell, they're not making it for the people around them to buy it. They're making it for someone they don't know to buy it. And something that's really, yeah. Yeah, exactly. They, they're thinking that someone who may exist or may not will come in and swoop up the art and say, here's 20,000 pounds. When actually, like, I don't know, that's, I don't know. I don't know how well that comes from actually, but um, actually because some people do that. But um, <laughs> with this, with these other communities that uh, sustain themselves uh, regardless of if some random sh uh, whale is going to come in and give them a lot of money, um, they actually make things that people they know want. And so they they know their market because it's right in front of them. Um, and it's like much more, they like, right, you can have this and I can make this for £200 because I know you and you want this for £200. And also I know this person here who said, I love your first suit, can you make me one? And I can make one for 10,000 pounds. So like the market is actually right in front of them. It's not it's not hard to find out who to do it for. And I think maybe that's something we're really messing up on actually, because like um, if we make work as like a bunch of people with the same subject, maybe the people who've made the work want the other work that's just been made. Because um, often when we get to see it, we see the work and we say, wow, that works really great. But actually, we don't have any access to get it. Or, and, and I want to see the video again, but I can't. So maybe it's about um, kind of seeing the communities made when these projects happen and then saying, right, actually, that's the market. The, the market is already there. There could be another one, but that is a market currently made. Yeah, absolutely. And when you start to think about that, you start to kind of wonder if, yeah, the 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 kind of traditional mark, art market where you know the with full of high net worth individuals that whole concept starts to look more and more kind of like another niche actually and um those kind of markets that you're talking about of interest of peers of community um yeah look like they could be increasingly vi viable especially with the different kinds of platforms that we've been touching on and talking about i think that might relate to some of the questions that have come up in the q a Joe, are you there to pick up on some or shall I grab them? I am, I'm here and uh, there's some great questions coming through and thank you to everybody for the thought provoking presentations and the, and the conversation that's carried on from that point. Um, there's many interested people who are thinking about the diversity of platforms that may be emerging moving forward from this point um, in that adoption, significant adoption of um, technologies. Um, would the panel like to come in and think about, well, a preferred platform and then thinking about the future platform, who would control the future for the, for the future for born digital art? phrase that's been brought up 